So uh, welcome everyone to Facebook Live. We've just been chatting here uh, with Dr. Marvin Berman and with, uh, and with Julie G. Uh, and thanks to both of you for taking some time with us today. And uh, so our sympathies go out to the royal family and, and Queen, for Queen Elizabeth II's uh, passing. Uh, and we hope that in fact, uh, one of her interests and certainly uh, now King Charles had a great interest in health and in future health and, and how to improve this. So we hope that uh, addressing cognitive decline is going to be something that she would be uh, approving of. Uh, so let's start uh, with Dr. Berman. Uh, we had talked once before. We're thrilled to have you back again. I think that, you know, just to Great lay to out you. the big picture, we're all interested in preventing and reversing cognitive decline. Such a huge problem all over the world. Uh, now said to be the based on epidemiology, the third leading cause of death in the United States, the second leading cause in the UK, by the way, and the first number one cause of death in UK women. Uh, so this is a huge problem. And uh, sure the is. research that we did over the years really suggests yeah. that this is at its most fundamental nature, a network insufficiency. You have hormones, you have toxins, you have inflammagens, you have pathogens, you have all these different things playing on this neuroplasticity network, and ultimately, you're failing in that what you supply is being exceeded chronically by, by the demand. And the good news is, when we address that, improve the supply, reduce the demand, we see repeatedly people getting better and staying better. And it's come up repeatedly that one of the things, when you look at an overall protocol for people to get them better, stimulation, with light, the sort of thing that Dr. Berman is a, is a real expert in, um, has been one of the things that has been associated with best outcomes. And so Dr. Berman, thanks so much for joining us. And I know you've actually got a few slides to show with some of your own data. And we, we've been talking recently about our own trial that we just published a few weeks ago where we saw 84% of the people actually improved. Um, great to see your data. Uh, please show us uh, your data on improvement with light. Great. Thanks, Dale and Julie. Thanks, and uh, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, being interested in non-invasive, non-drug options for treatment. That's what brings us all together here on the talk. That's and uh, I hope that we can encourage and inspire people to take seriously the idea that there really is something that you can do yeah. to make a significant difference in cognitive health and that we have to kind of dispel that fatalism that was so prevalent for a long time, which we've now found out was based on a lie. Yeah. You know, absolutely. So I'm, I'm really glad to be able to be here now and, and to share the information. What we came to see was that photobiomodulation was the tissue level intervention that we could rely on and see was able to make that specific biological change in the brain functioning and specifically in the neurons so that we could elevate the brain's ability not only to heal itself and repair, but also to confer a certain degree of protection against further damage. And we saw that with the 1,070 nanometer infrared light, which is different than a lot of the other devices that have been out there for a long time. And we started looking at 1070 back in 2007, 2008, and we saw that there was a significant difference in the penetration and in the effects of the different wavelengths. Recently, with one of our colleagues at uh, University of Texas at Arlington, they published a paper showing that the 1070, they used 1064 and 800 nanometer laser. They showed that that was a significant improvement in the uh, oxygenated hemoglobin, mm -hmm. that when you use the 1064 or 1070, you were getting a 100% increase in oxygenated hemoglobin and cytochrome C oxidase, which is the chemical, the protein that really stimulates the production of ATP. And that's one of the things that we always need more of because we're always using all of it all the time. So, so let's, let's back up for one second here, because I think you're 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 using some terms that some people not may, may well, not that's be right. familiar that's with. Right. 
So let's talk first about, okay, so first of all, there, there's the, the, the wavelength of the light that you're actually using. So what you're talking about, you know, I remember from uh, when I used to do research, uh, I was using a spectrophotometer and using, a, uh, using fluoroscopy, you can see to out about, a human can see to out about 690 nanometers or so, maybe 680. Or so. Yeah, you can get up baby. around 800. You can get up around 800 and you see a little bit. Yeah, so it basically it becomes red and then it just disappears. So as you're getting above there, you know, 850, 900, these are longer wavelengths. You're headed right. in the long range, you're headed way out to radio waves, but you're starting with, which is, with what is now infrared. Um, so yeah. now you're talking about near infrared and far infrared. So you're talking about you get out to about a little over a thousand. Right. That's where you're actually seeing the best results. Is that fair to say? That's fair. That's fair to say. And it's important. I think you're right to go back to the basics and and make sure people understand that 85 percent of the reason there's life on Earth is because of that near infrared band. Yeah. In terms of stimulating stimulating the activity in chlorophyll and photosynthesis in the same way that it does it in the brain with the with with Very ATP and, and, and the mitochondria. Now let's also tell people because people worry sometimes, oh wait a minute, light that can be damaging. Yes, ultraviolet light. We're now yeah. talking about, you know, 250, 280, that's that's down in the in the ultraviolet. That's powerful light, high energy, can be damaging to things like DNA. And now we're talking about X-rays and gamma rays, which are even shorter and more powerful. Right. So we're now way past the visible spectrum, all the way out into the infrared. So the this is not light that's going to damage your DNA. If anything, um, it actually has a healing property. Yes. Uh, and then that is even true in the retina. Yes. So this is an, an area that's actually very interesting. Now, the question then is, we're dealing with a, a disease where there is a network insufficiency. And right. you're now putting some energy back. You're seeing it in hemoglobin. You're seeing it in cytochrome C, which is a critical part of right. your mitochondrial function. So how is the body taking advantage of that? Are they absorbing the photons? Yes. Uh, what, is, what is actually happening at that wavelength? The, the light is being absorbed by the mitochondria as if it was food but it's stimulating okay. one particular part of the mitochondria, which then speeds up that little motor that we see in the mitochondria, and it speeds up the eventual production of the ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Now, do you see more ATP production when you yes. do this? Yes. Okay, so that's a critical piece. So you are actually producing energy. Now, of yes. course, one of the other areas where energy is a critical failure is Parkinson's. Yes. Have you and have you tried this for people with Parkinson? Well, interestingly, the study that we did with our partners at Baylor Research Institute, which is connected with uh, Texas A&M and the Baylor Scott and White uh, Department of Neurosurgery. So my my colleagues there were getting patients, subjects for the research from the regional movement disorders clinic downstairs. Yeah. So they had people who were duly diagnosed with dementia and Parkinson's. Yeah. So at the end of the trial, we were only focused on the dementia and cognitive functioning, right. but the, the subjects and their families reported uniformly uh, that there was greater fluidity of movement, greater ability to understand speech, better sleep, better mood, more willing, uh, less apathy, and more willingness yeah. to participate in the family um, of, of all of the people who were getting the active treatment, because this was a randomized yeah. double-blind placebo trial. So we were very pleased to see that, and I've certainly seen that clinically in, in our practice over the years, that people when they get the right amount at the right location, they get much better results because you don't want to do too much stimulation and produce too much dopamine in the central, in the sensory motor area. You want to have it all really back in the occipital region where the dopamine neurons are getting damaged. Yeah. So we focus, and that's why we, the, we designed the Neradiant device that we're now able to provide we designed it so that it has the ability to selectively deliver the light in the front, the back, the left, and the right. And we can design protocols to specifically target areas 
specifically because of this issue of where do you need the treatment? Where do you need the stimulation? Yeah. Now, I imagine a lot of people are saying right now, hey, wait a minute. Are you going to drill uh, open my skull here to put this? How are you going to get your stimulation into my brain without hurting my skull? I think this is where I should probably go to the slides. Okay, great. Um, so the, the focus of our, our work has been primarily on dementia. Okay. And we know that, you know, this is a worldwide problem. And we know that there's no early diagnosis, though there seems to be mention of that even today uh, from Germany. But what we know is that near infrared light directed externally toward the skull can penetrate into the skull and down into the brain just by virtue of the wavelength of the infrared light being able to penetrate it deeply into the brain. And we know that it's going to improve the mitochondrial activity that I mentioned before, and yeah. thereby improve the available energy that's going to then be able to accelerate healing as well as protecting against further injury. And that's what we call photobiomodulation. When we did the trial with about 100 subjects, we saw that the mini mental status exam was one of the things that changed dramatically over two months. We saw that people who were using the device, putting it on their head, pushing a button, and letting their brain be stimulated for six minutes, twice a day, at the end of two months, there was a 4.8 point improvement in the mini metal status exam among the people who got the active treatment compared to the controls. Um, one of the common tests that people use is the clock drawing test. And you can see that there is a significant difference in the clock drawing from the active and the placebo group. Yeah. All right. We then did what's called quantitative EEG, which is a 19 channel, again, non-invasive recording in the same way, identical to an EKG, except you're putting these electrodes on your head. But we're measuring 19 very specific locations and then being able to compare those individual readings against a normative database that's broken out by age, gender, and left or right-handed. So we can see how an individual's brain electrical activity is stacking up against an average of people who are you know, the same gender, same age within about a year or two, um, and same handedness about how they stack up in terms of their brain electrical activity. And what we saw was that there was a really significant aggregate change in the amplitude or the, vol the voltage of the slower brain waves, which are the ones associated with dementia and its progression. The more people progress in memory loss and dementia, the more higher amplitude slow waves, the delta and the theta we see. And so here you can see on the left is the pre and the, and the post. And we can see that these blue areas are indicative of significant change in reduction of, of slow wave amplitude. So that's a really big improvement in terms of overall power, right? We're seeing that again, these slow wave power, the amplitude, the voltage is significantly reduced. These red areas in the beginning are now all the way down to this one little area here. And this is a comparison of all of the people in the, in the treatment group. This is an aggregate value. And here we're talking about the sensory motor rhythm which is that brain state that is the most relaxed. It's kind of relaxed attention. It's like being in the zone. Yeah. And so we're seeing that being in the zone, the amount of area, amount of area what, that you're producing that activity went from here all the way into this whole area in the central and the back. So this is very important data about how the brain changes state just from photobiomodulation alone. The, the solution that we came up with was to modify the device so that we could deliver targeted, like I said, targeted stimulation using a lower power, but a much more targeted ability. And we can do that with standard settings and we can also do it then in customization. And the customization happens in this screen where we can then 
independently segregate where we deliver the light at what pulse rate and at what intensity. And this all is driven by the quantitative EEG, which I was talking about before. And so we use the EEG as a way to target what kind of stimulation is needed at what location, at what intensity. Right, gotcha. And then uh, there's a lot of discussion about gamma frequency. So now modulating the light at something like 40 hertz, which is tip pretty exactly. typically. And I see exactly. you mentioning here pulse rate of 20. How did you choose 20? And do you think that uh, gamma uh, you know, stimulation is better, worse, the same? What's your sense about that? Uh, that was purely for an example. But okay. if we were doing treatment <clears throat> with people with cognitive issues, we generally start with a, a morning, uh, an AM treatment model that involves 40 hertz. We can also then move between 14 and 20, which is the SMR low beta area, which then yeah. helps people improve their focus and their relaxation, but not get not get too overstimulated. And then we can move into evening sundown and we can switch the treatment to the theta and the delta activity. So what we're really doing in the broad scheme of this treatment model is we're trying to renormalize circadian rhythm. Right. So we're waking people up in the morning when the sun comes up, and yeah. then we're helping people go to sleep when the sun goes down. And we're seeing significant improvement in the sleep architecture and the quality. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, which is obviously a very, very important area. So as I understand it, then, when you're showing us these data with 4.8 point improvement on MMSE, which is striking, uh, then you're really looking at that as a single modality. Is it correct that they didn't change anything else? It was just the stimulation. Everything else was held constant. Right, that's correct. Everything was held constant, and they just get the they got the light therapy, and two months later, they did a beginning, a middle, and a, a two months assessment of quantitative EEG, and then a full neuropsych battery. Yeah, and we often talk about what is the difference between someone with subjective cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment, and then dementia? Do you right. see differences in terms of the response of people oh, who very are clearly. farther along or people who are less far along? Yeah, very clearly you can see, and neurology has been publishing this for 50 years, but they never had anything to offer. So they right. just kept doing the same thing over and over again. Um, <laughs> but when I saw the data, it was very clear that the people with mild impairment had only a certain amount of ampli high amplitude slow waves and a certain decrement in the faster wave amplitudes. And that as people progressed in dementia, there was a direct correlation between progression in dementia and the amplitude of slow waves and the decrement in fast waves. Right, and but also, now in the response was what I'm talking about. When you, yeah. you see a difference in response, to your infrared when you have someone who's farther along versus someone who's less far along? Of course, we see that there's more latitude in their ability to reverse the process. And that's why when we talked the last time, you know, everything we said was time is the enemy. Yeah. And that what we need to do is start as early as possible. And that's when you talked about the fact that seeing even mild, you're really talking about a process that's been going on for 10 to 15 years. Yes. And that's absolutely true. Yeah. So now that we can start looking at biomarkers to determine when people are starting to show those problems and then provide these non-drug, non-invasive interventions that people can do literally themselves at home, I think we're in a much better position, especially given the fact that I think the, the data now shows that something between 10 and 30% of everyone who's gotten COVID independent of the severity of their symptoms is likely to start showing neurological symptoms. Yeah, that's a really so good that point is, that uh, brain fog is a big one for long COVID. Tremendous. And, yeah, the long COVID is now a tremendously difficult problem. And luckily, the, the neuradiant and the V-light are now showing that they can be effective interventions for COVID. We published a paper, a narrative review on using 1070 as a treatment for COVID about four months ago. And now um, V-Light is gonna be presenting at Harvard 
tomorrow on their findings having to do with COVID and the uh, the V-Lite. That's a good point. So if you could talk a little bit, I know with V-Lite, one of the concerns is um, how much power does it actually have? How much penetration does it actually have? Right. Um, right. Your equipment is a little, it's bigger, it's more powerful, it's also uh, more expensive. Are there advantages and disadvantages uh, and do you see differences in the data that you see generated from the Neuradiant versus the V-Lite? Well, we've certainly, we've certainly seen that there's a significant difference. And uh, Hanley Liu's lab at UT Arlington published on the changes in the hemoglobin that we were talking about and the cytochrome C. There was a 100% difference between the 800 and the 850 and the 1064. So the 1070 produced significantly more over the same amount of time. The thing that was really interesting in that study is that they then did a comparison of the 810 laser, I'm sorry, the 800 laser and the 810 LED. And they showed that there was a similar progression of improving hemoglobin and cytochrome C up to about four minutes, but then the laser in, increased. But then as soon as they turned off the laser, the, the activity and the improvement dropped like a rock, yeah. whereas the LED continued to improve slowly beyond the time that they were continuing to measure. Oh, so the issue of lasting effect, right? That's yeah. what we're getting at. What is going to produce the lasting effect? Clearly, it's the LED activity. And we now know that the 1070 has a greater impact in terms of those two main biological markers. Yeah. And maybe so, it could come to Julie for a moment, because Julie uh, interacts with thousands of people and is the founder of ApoE4.info. So many people who are ApoE4 positive and certainly interested in prevention and reversal of cognitive decline. Do you have a sense, Julie, for uh, overall in the group uh, for, and on uh, ApoE4.info, uh, what percentage of people do you think are doing some form uh, of light therapy? You know, it's hard for me to get a sense of the percentage, and I'm looking at a, a, a big audience, apoe4.info, mm -hmm. and all of your um, followers on Facebook and the various groups. Um, one thing I can say is that I see about 50% of people getting improvement from this, mm -hmm. and about 50% aren't noticing any benefit. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I was going to say, Dr. Berman very kindly um, let let me try his device. Yeah, and I was one of those that would give it mixed reviews. Yeah, um, I it caused like a, a stuffiness of my sinuses, hmm. but one positive that I did notice was that I, I wasn't feeling sad uh, before I did it, but I felt happier after I did it. Okay. So I felt this lightening of mood, but ultimately the sinus issue that it was uh, creating for me led me not to be able to uh, use it. So I'd love to hear from Dr. Berman why you well, think, think that, that happened. Yeah. Thank you for bringing it up. I, I really yeah. appreciate that because one of the things that I found, and we were just getting started when we when yeah. we shared that device with you, one of the things that I wanted to make sure of was that we were doing very close monitoring and supervision of how people were using it. And one of the things that I did, which I regret and I apologize publicly, is I didn't stay on top of it as much as I should have with you because basically you used it in a way that would give you that overdose reaction. And that if you, would, you, if you use it let, more stepwise, and less intensely, one of the things that you can do is mitigate those overdose reactions because sinus responses, agitation, irritability, dizziness, headache, all of those things can be reactions to getting too much stimulation. So yeah. one of the things that we've made a very strong effort to do with everyone who's using the neuronic is that they get direct supervision from me on a regular basis to set up the protocol so that, that never happens again. Yeah, maybe, well, if I yeah. could just... Oh, I'm sorry. I want to jump in with uh, something. So I, I probably did overdo it at the beginning, 
But then I stopped it for several weeks and just used it for very short periods, like three minutes as you had recommended. And the same thing happened. <laughs> so it makes me wonder if something else was happening. Yeah. You know, well, I, I, okay. Well, it could be that three minutes, this is, this is a great point. Yeah. With some people, three minutes is still too much. Yeah. With some people, 30 seconds is all they can make good use of a wow. day. And if that's the case, we need to work with them to make sure that they're only using the right amount of dose for them at that time. And it's really important that people understand this isn't a hairdryer. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. we really have to make sure that you're following, like nobody would do that with a bottle of pills. Yeah. Right. But with the helmet, they feel less willing, more willing to experiment. And we need yeah. to make sure that we're being very mindful in how we help people manage the way they use this tool. Because it can be very powerful and very useful, and it can give you a runny nose. Yeah, you know, I'm wondering, we're always coming back to the fact that uh, historically, there's been no understanding about what Alzheimer's actually is. And that's right. been the problem. So people think it's you know, it's all about misfolded proteins, or it's all about amyloid, or it's all about tau or herpes simplex, or you just go right down the list. And none of these has ever led to a really successful treatment. When right. we look at this kind of supply and demand of, the, of this network, we can start to see, okay, here are the things we need to change. Uh, you know, are we missing a pathogen? Are we missing a toxin? Julie, right. I'm wondering, you are you know, one of the few, I think, who's really done a, the, the amazing job. And you're at the point where your supply and demand have done very well. You, you've been over 10 years uh, improving yourself and doing very, very well. I kind of wonder, is it possible that you've kind of met that? And so anything you're doing with the light is actually maybe pushing you beyond. And so you're going to have to go up very slowly with that. I don't know. But I know that I know you as an extremely diligent person. And you've run down things like toxins you've been exposed to and pathogens you've been exposed to and treated these one by one yep. and gotten yourself to be insulin sensitive and metabolically flexible and hormonally optimal and on and on and on. So I wonder whether this may be something that if you were a little out of kilter, uh, maybe this would have helped you more instead of maybe pushing you over the top. It's just, you know, just a thought. It's also yeah. that it's also that we we didn't segment the delivery of the light. We let you use it all globally. And for some people that's really useful. For some people you really have to target it. And that's why we're using the QEEG in order to target people. It's yeah. very important. This is a great conversation because it's very important people understand that you know this is something that is part of a process. And do you think this not, helps? It's not a magic bullet, you know, it's yeah. part of a process. Does this help most when you find areas of delta? It helps. It helps significantly in improving slow wave activity, yeah. and and it helps also in decreasing the higher, faster wave activity, which is kind of the compensation that you yeah. see in the brain. So yeah. you want to really look at. We can mitigate both of those, and okay. you can do it in the same protocol. Yeah, see, I don't think Julie has a slow wave in her in her brain. She's always going. She's always got something going on, and she's amazing. And she's got a great memory and great yeah, cognition. No, it's great. Overall. Now, um, fast waves from some inflammation, she may have some of those, because she's certainly been exposed to some inflammations in the past. So maybe uh, maybe that's something that could be helpful. All right. Well, this is this is very helpful, uh, and uh, there there are some excellent questions here. Let's go through some of these questions. Uh, one of them relates to what you talked about, Marvin, a few minutes ago, which is long COVID. Right. And we argue that anyone who's had COVID, and especially if you've had any brain fog, please get on treatment. There is so much that can be done and Absolutely. continue to give, it, give yourself a better future where you're not having cognitive decline. What's really interesting right. is there's more and more published now on the mechanisms of long yes. COVID. And part of this seems to be immune dysregulation. Part of this seems to be a propensity to microthrombi. So you're really looking at areas of reduced support energetically. Part of this seems now to be uh, due to continued exposure to some of the spike protein, whether yes. it's quote, live virus and propagating virus or not. Or it's, 
Or the vaccine, right. Exactly, or the vaccine. And so the, all of these things may come into play and we may have to address all of them. But you well, mentioned earlier, you've had some good results with- We have, and, and I think I can publish, I, I, I think I should send you the paper that we published because the thrombosis issue, the blood, the clotting yeah. is one of the things that 1070 is very effective on helping to remediate. Oh, that's fantastic. And so how do you think the 1070, this, this wavelength of 1070 in the infrared helps people who are having microthrombi? Uh, I think it helps with the apoptosis in the cells and it, it certainly mitigates against the apoptosis. So the cell repair is able to be maintained. Um, I don't want to get into the heat shock protein conversation, right. but it's really it's really in that realm where the the light can activate specific emergency measures yeah. within the body to protect against the cell getting uh, killed. Yeah, great. So yeah, it sounds like I mean anyone who's had COVID should really think seriously about brain health and, and brain treatment. Something like yes, Not only for the present, but for the future as well. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, let's see, Karina is asking what type of light. Now you mentioned very clearly the, the infrared, um, but you also mentioned the modulation of this at typically 40 hertz, uh, at, at least at times, and then getting at the times, circadian yeah. rhythm that you mentioned, which yeah. is a very, very interesting. And uh, leeway okay. size, yeah, leeway size work at, 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 uh, at right. MIT, MIT yeah. showed that. And then uh, Yvonne says that uh, they embarked on the protocol in Scotland at Cognition, and Cognition has done an excellent job with a number of patients I'm aware of. But in this case, uh, the, her mother actually declined. And I should mention, you know, in our trial, uh, we're not to the point where 100% of people improve. 84% of the people in the trial improved. Um, and as Julie was saying, and I think this is really interesting, here you had 50% of the people who seem to be responding to the light and 50% who may not, which goes along right. very well with what is your rate limiting step? If your rate limiting step is that you've got some undiagnosed pathogen or toxin exposure, maybe the light is not gonna be the best thing for you. So I think, you know, again, going forward, human beings are complex organisms. We're right. not to the point yet where 100% of people improve. I wish we were, I look forward to the day that we will be. But the most important thing to do to get there is to determine for each person what's driving the process. Now, she goes right. on to say they've invested in both V-Lite um, and also the Quiet Mind uh, product that you've talked about, Dr. Berman, and love to. she said she'd love to help her mother um, and improve her overall health. So again, I would recommend, please, um, it, it, when things are going downhill, the typical story is something has been missed. Right. One of the few patients in our trial who got worse was someone who had very high amounts of mycotoxins in her home. When she was told this by Dr. Hathaway, she said, I'm not leaving the home. I'm not fixing the mycotoxin. I'm not remediating. I'm doing it here. And you know, not, not surprisingly, she actually uh, declined over time, which is the natural history. Uh, so yes, please do everything possible. And I think it's great right. that you've got the, the light and you know, let's keep, I would keep on uh, with the doctors uh, at uh, Cognition to determine whether they're things that may not have been addressed. Next one here is from Rajia, who's asking about chronic fatigue with mitochondrial damage. And you talked earlier about mitochondria. Have you done this with people who have chronic fatigue syndrome? Yes. And people who have chronic fatigue syndrome who then take on dealing with the toxins I mean, taking that three-legged stool approach of yeah. functional medicine, photobiomodulation, and neurofeedback, people take that approach, I think they're going to see that things like chronic fatigue and all those kind of autoimmune issues can certainly improve, but you really have to balance out what really is driving the, the underlying process, because the right, functional that's... medicine, I think, is the basis. Yeah. And when you look at this, I mean, people who've had COVID and people who have cognitive decline for other reasons, and then people who have myalgic encephalitis or chronic fatigue. I mean, it is amazing. Uh, you know, this group of people, this is a large, large group of people. Uh, and then one other question, uh, which is critical, and this is from Electa, who is saying, is this safe for patients who have had seizures? Now, we always talk about um, does uh, alpha frequency, uh, does that increase risk for uh, seizures? Have you had any problem with- No, no, the, the, the seizure, yeah. 
the seizure risk is usually from the pulsing of stimulation right. coming in. Right, pulsing of can't, typically, can't see, it's, can't typically see it. it's visual light. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. So you haven't seen increase in seizures. So you're saying this is safe for someone who's had seizures. A decrease yeah. in seizures. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then mentioned here, let's see here. I says here, this is from Chris, who says, I used V light, alpha, and gamma for one year. I saw no improvements. Um, I have suspected CTE. Can you explain why it may not help everyone? Well, I think again, it's important to point out for each of us there is a rate limiting step and sometimes more than one. So, and, and I think, you know, just to, I don't want to put Julie on the spot again, but look, Julie did fantastic for years and right. then came up and Julie, maybe you could talk a little bit about your own journey where you found something was not quite going right. And you had to then identify it, which you did and, and addressed it successfully. Thanks to you. <laughs> but yeah, I did plateau after a while and I yep. mentioned it to you and you told me to get checked out for a chronic inflammatory response syndrome. I did all those biomarkers and they were all out of kilter. You were absolutely mm -hmm. right. And then you helped me find a practitioner that helped me identify that I had a Lyme disease co-infection called the Babesia. Yeah, and it was a pretty acute case yeah. of it. Well, and it had been going on for over a decade. So yeah. addressing that was really helpful. Yeah, so again, I would recommend for Chris, please, yes, you're talking about CTE, which is really a tauopathy and tau as a prion is promoting this. So yeah, you'd wanna look at, if you're going to be getting light stimulation, I always think of this a little bit like kind of lifting weights. Great for you as long as you've got the appropriate nutrition and everything. You know, remember these things right. are these things work together. They're coordinated. So this let's brings back to you, Dr. Berman. When people are doing this, they are stimulating their brains. Do you recommend other things to optimize things so that they are now clearly some people will already be capable. They'll have great nutrition. They'll have great growth factors. They'll have all what they need. Other people will not. What do you recommend for best outcomes? Certainly that they work with a functional medicine practitioner like a recode or a recode coach or someone who, you know, went through functional medicine training. But also I found that a lot of people uh, get a lot of benefit from things like heart rate variability training yeah. and improving their heart rate variability, which is the variation in the beats in between the time in between beats. And so that's a really important outcome measure. Uh, and an indicator of overall cardiac health. If they yeah. do neurofeedback, that can also be an incredibly useful tool because it helps to renormalize the EEG electrical activity, the network activity, right? And we've been talking about networks all along. Well, yep. the only way to repair the network damage at an electrical level so far is neurofeedback. So that's an effective way of renormalizing EEG neuroconnectivity. So if you treat the tissue level problem with functional medicine and photobiomodulation to increase the system's health and capacity to improve, then you can in introduce the neurofeedback as a way to normalize connectivity. And right. that will help make, this, make the improvement stick because you're putting the floor in. Right. And so now all these other interventions let, sit on the floor. And the EEG is now working to be most efficient. So your central nervous system is functioning more efficiently. And if you make your central nervous system function more efficiently, anything that's mediated by it is then going to improve if there's a problem. Yeah. And then uh, Chris goes on to say, I, I do wonder in some cases if our brains can be too damaged to help. And this comes up a lot. Is there a point where you give up yeah. You know, and, and I have to say, I got, a, I got a letter a few years ago from a guy who said, look, please don't tell people there's a time to give up. He said, my wife had a MOCA score of zero in a nursing home. We put her on the protocol. You know, her MOCA score didn't go up that much. But guess what? She's talking again. She's engaging again. She's dressing herself again. She's really improved. She's back with us again. And so he said, you know, please yeah. don't tell people to, to give up. And so I do think, you know, in the long run, we'll be able to do something for everybody. These are early days. We're not right. there yet, but we do see dramatic and repeated improvements. Right. So for Chris, 
Yeah, you mentioned a full, full uh, neurological memory testing. Please, uh, you know, please you know, look at this, look at your quantitative EEG. Uh, maybe consider some stem cells. There are groups getting good results with stem cells. It depends on what's driving the problem. And so let's discover that in order to give you the best outcomes. Now you're right about one thing. When you have, if you do have CTE, the tau itself is prionic. In other words, the phospho tau and the, the tau that is quote misfolded, that is alternatively folded, does give rise to more of the, of the same, more tau. That is the prionic loop nature, but really prionic loops are part of feed forward signaling. They are positive feedback signaling, anti-homeostatic signaling. So yes, we want to reduce that. And there are many ways to do that. So please you know, get, get together with a, an experienced practitioner who's getting good results. Next one is from Stephen who says, how does direct sunlight compare and how much daylight compares uh, to uh, how many minutes of treatment? So obviously there are some differences. You're talking about infrared, not visible. Yeah. Sunlight well, is it's, a, it's always a fun question. That's yeah. always a fun yeah. question. You can get about the same amount of stimulation uh, with the helmet that you could get in about a hundred hours of standing at the equator at noon. <laughs> okay, so that's about. a good comparison. Yeah, uh, and then uh, Demetra says, "I've had brain fog for several several years before getting COVID." You know, absolutely, you can get it from hormonal imbalance. You can get it from exposure to pathogens. Many, many ways to get it. We're just talking about it with COVID because it's so common, and yeah, we we've seen it with the all the time. Yeah. yeah, we've seen it with chemotherapy a, a, a great deal. Absolutely. That's another one. Victoria asks, will a near infrared sauna help the brain? Obviously can help certainly by sweating, by getting rid of the toxins, but two very different mechanisms. One is directly to the brain as Dr. Berman is talking about. The yeah. other one is really helping you detox just as you know, sweating from exercise and things like that are doing. Um, then Rajia is asking, is the 1070 something we can purchase? And uh, Dr. Berman, if you could talk a little bit about that. So how would Rajia get this if she wanted to? The company, the company that has taken our research and our development work, uh, and now we're partnering with is called Neuronic Devices Limited. And uh, you can reach them at neuronic, N-E-U-R-O-N-I-C dot online. And okay. you can purchase the device through them. And we're providing a 10% discount for everybody who's listening and also an ongoing 10% discount for all the Apollo members. Thank you. Yeah, and again, we're all here for the same reason, the best outcome. What can we do to get the best outcomes for something that has always been untreatable, terminal illness, and yet we're seeing so many people now improving and staying improved. Uh, and then uh, Rajia is asking, uh, I guess this is for you, Julie. Um, do you think the sinus issue is is has something to do with die off of mold? Um, I was having sinus issues because I was living in mold at the time, but this exacerbated it. Yeah, yeah. I also have a question for Dr. Berman in terms of accessing this therapy. So are there a lot of practitioners that are offering the EEG and the device? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Neurofeedback and putting it all together. There are probably 20,000 providers of neurofeedback worldwide. Um, there are a number of growing number of providers who are now getting the Neradian and providing it to their patients. The more, the more appropriate way for people to be thinking about this is something that they're going to have at home and do themselves and that we're going to teach them how to use it. Their providers are going to teach them and support them in how to use it, along with the neurofeedback. The neurofeedback can also be done by, by people themselves at home. We've been doing that for 15 years, where we get equipment for people, teach them how to use it, and then we provide the ongoing supervision, which we can do online. Okay. All right. And then the next one here uh, is from Julie, who says, will the amethyst Richway Biomat do the same thing? Wondering what type of infrared light to use at home. Are you familiar with this? The amethyst Richway Biomat? I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, uh, th these are these are PEMF uh, infrared devices that radiate uh, up into the body and they can be they can be helpful in a systemic way. I, I've, I've certainly been 
uh, working with people who have the neuradiant and they have something called a beamer, and they're seeing a very useful combinational benefit. So I, I think that, again, it's how smart are you? How skilled are you? How well have you figured out how to integrate these things? Yeah. And that, unfortunately, the patient has now been relegated to the role of clinical quarterback. Yeah. And that um, it just doesn't make sense when you've got this kind of complexity, especially systemic complexity. And often actually fighting with your physician who's telling you that uh, nothing can be done to prevent, reverse, or delay Alzheimer's, as we've heard repeatedly, yeah. despite yeah. all the published papers, et cetera. Carlos asks, says, I have a red light panel that uses red and near red. Uh, yeah. Can I get similar benefits? Are you aware of these panels? Yeah, I am. And, and there are a range of panels out there. The amount of power that you can deliver with those panels yeah. is dependent on, on A, the wavelength and the power of the panel, but it's also the distance from the skin. Yeah. So the power diminishes at the square of the distance. Yeah. So putting one of those very hot panels near your skin is a very risky right. idea. Makes sense. And then what about lupus patients who have photosensitivity? Now, presumably their photosensitivity right. uh, is UV. for other wavelengths, yeah, but UV. I don't know that. Uh, have you had any issues with your uh, with your 1070? No, okay. it's primarily the UV sensitivity that people are dealing with there. Yeah, and then uh, again, Rajia, who's saying, where can I get a QEEG? And so there are many practitioners, well, check yeah, with your practitioner. Many of them are using quantitative EEGs. Yeah, you can email, really you can email the foundation for that. We'll, we'll yeah, provide they're, they're, that information. Yeah, I mean, there's... Uh, they're very helpful for getting real-time uh, results to see, you know, are you improving this? And we, right. we see this, this all the we time. Use, actually, we, use we had a guy actually just a couple of weeks ago uh, who contacted me, uh, who very smart guy uh, and still, you know, acing all of his uh, cognitive testing, but he knew something was wrong. He basically has SCI. Uh, and sure enough, when he did the quantitative EEG and when he did the P300 and the evoke responses, they were all abnormal. So it really confirmed that there was something going on with this guy, even though he's still able to score very, very well at this oh, early yeah. stage. Uh, and next thing you're, Yeah, you're right. The, you, there's a group that you've worked with, Evoke Neuroscience, who right. does that yeah. combination. Yeah, we're working with Evoke Neuroscience now. Great, fantastic. All right, next one is here from uh, Victoria, who says, does this help with aphasia? So primary progressive aphasia can be a presentation of Alzheimer's. We see it all the time. It's one of the non-amnestic presentations, typically associated with exposure to toxins, although not always. Uh, one of the ones that uh, remember well is from uh, paraffin, uh, candle burning exposure for years in a relatively young woman, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, that's one. Of course, it can also be with frontotemporal dementia. So you're going to want to know which one of these uh, is, is going on here. But certainly, again, this is something where presumably you would, you would stimulate as part of the treatment. And you would stimulate only on the left hemisphere. Okay. Got it. And, and that's certainly where the, where the abnormalities are found pathologically. Uh, and then uh, Paul is saying the data presented by Marvin is from our device produced here in the UK with 1070 nanometers. Great. Uh, we're going to be recruiting to run an Alzheimer's trial here in the UK. It works by producing nitric oxide, improved blood flow, as well as mitochondrial effects, induction of chaperone proteins, which you mentioned earlier, Marvin, uh, and reducing, therefore, amyloid and tau pathology. So, so multiple mechanisms, uh, which is fantastic. So you'll see here on the notes uh, where to, uh, the uh, URLs here, the sites. So fantastic. This is, uh, again, we need more proof. We need more exactly. trials. We need more people. And we need more people to show improvement to be able to say, look, this is something that we're seeing all the time. Now, I realize we're, uh, we're coming here to the end of our time. So we'll take the rest of these questions online. Uh, and can we get some last words from you, Dr. Berman? Um, I'm, I'm so grateful to you and Julie and Apollo for making it possible in the grander scheme of things like Facebook Live to bring us together and make it clear that there really are alternatives that are evidence-based, that are shown to be effective, and that are now moving more and more into the mainstream. 
and that people need to take them more seriously because there's evidence to back it up. And yeah. that it's not just my opinion. It's not just your opinion. There's real evidence being provided by clinicians with integrity who, you know, don't fudge their data and can show what's really going on and show real results. We have a trust pilot site where there are people who are using the Neradiant are now posting their responses. So people can go and look at independent comments from people who are just posting what happened to them. And it's happening more and more now. Absolutely. So we're looking forward to working with everybody who's signed up and hoping that we can work with Apollo to integrate. And, and also, can we get the Recode doctors to engage with these tools as well? Exactly. And Julie, any last words here? from apoe4.info and and, uh, and your experiences over the years? Um, you know, I just want to thank Dr. Berman for the opportunity to try the device and I'm very intrigued and I'm going to come back to it again <laughs> and give it another try. Great. Because I certainly believe in the science and um, I'm going to make sure I'm out of mold, I think, before I try it again and yep. go very slowly. I'd love to do it within EEG and um, neurobiofeedback. We will do the whole nine yards, Julie. I would, I would really. The whole nine yards. And also, I want to thank you for offering to help, you know, all of Dale's followers find providers who can do these oh, things. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, we can work. We can work that out. There's, there's somebody close to just about anybody, and mm -hmm. if not, there are ways to deliver the EEG act the EEG system directly to people's homes so they can do it themselves. Yeah, and for our entire community, let's all continue to work together to reduce the global burden of dementia. We're seeing it every day, and we can do it. And we can continue to add new things to enhance it, just as we've heard from Dr. Berman today. So thanks again, Dr. Berman. And we'll take the rest of these uh, questions online. Thanks. Thank